Hello, I'm Penelope Ruskin and I'm going to be talking today about my work and some of the resources that I've created. I'm going to start by answering questions that have been asked to me already um, and then um, at the end of all these questions I will leave it open um, to answer any questions from, from people here today. Um, so if you have any questions please put, put, do put them in the chat and we'll, we'll come to those uh, a bit later on. Um, and I'll do my best to answer as many of them as I can. Um, the first question that people often ask me about is, is how did I um, come to develop this approach to piano playing and piano teaching? So I'm just going to talk about that very, very briefly. Um, and I think it all started uh, when I was a student um, as a teenager, I found playing uh, very easy, it was very natural to me, and when I became a student, I was um, in a much more pressured environment, I was playing very big repertoire, and my hands aren't particularly big, and I was practicing many, many hours, and eventually that led to a, a lot of tension, uh, which I hadn't had before, and um, it, it eventually led to an injury. And what was very distressing at the time was that there were, I couldn't find anybody who could help me because most of the teachers at that stage, um, you know, I had many great teachers who talked wonderfully about music, but nobody could really help me with the technique and the physicality of the playing. So I, um, I went to a lot of different um, places to try and find answers and I experimented a lot and I tried Tai Chi and yoga and Alexander technique. Um, but I really explored in my own playing and also in my students um, what worked and what didn't work actually at the piano. And so over 40 years now, I've developed a whole series of exercises and, and solutions to very, very common problems that have worked not only for me, but for hundreds of, of my students. Um, so I realized that I wanted to put this out in, in um, books and, and in ways that other people could benefit from my experience and wouldn't have to find all these things out for themselves as I had to do. Um, so I uh, then started to create resources for, for other pianists. Um, and so uh, one of the other questions that has come up is, is you know, what, what is different about my approach? And um, there are um, many other excellent teachers and, and pianists working uh, nowadays who have come to very, very similar conclusions to me. Um, but what I think is, is different in my approach from uh, the way many people have traditionally been taught is that firstly, um, for me, music and the technique are inextricably linked. I don't suggest to my students, right, you're going to practice technique for an hour um, and now you'll go on to your music. As far as I'm concerned, I use the word technique in its broadest sense. Um, and so technique are the skills that we need to play the music in exactly the way we want it to be heard. And similarly, I don't think we can actually really be good technicians unless we've also got an understanding of what we want to achieve musically. So as far as I'm concerned, they're both inextricably linked and we have to work at them together. So whenever I'm talking about technique, it is absolutely musically focused. I'm saying the purpose of this is to be able to play in this way. But also when I'm teaching a, a, a piece of music, I'll be saying, hmm, yes, that's not quite working. Um, we want to be it to sound like this and this is the way we want to achieve that. Um, so I don't think of technique as just scales and arpeggios and playing fast and loud, which is a very traditional approach to technique. I see it as including all the skills that we use as pianists at the piano, creating a beautiful sound, creating a beautiful shape of phrase, um, pedaling, um, you know, everything connected with the music. Um, but first and foremost, I would say, for me is, is developing freedom of movement around the keyboard. Because if we're tense, if our muscles are very tight, 
Um, we can't move freely around the keyboard. We can't embrace the upper notes. We can't do leaps. We can't move quickly. And even, for instance, you can all try this if you feel like, you know, if you've got very tense arms, if you really tense up your elbow and your wrist and try and move your fingers, um, you'll feel that they're much less able to move freely than if you've got a lovely relaxed wrist and elbow. So a lot of my work is about really keeping um, freedom in the joints, the wrist, the elbow and the shoulder, um, so that we can uh, move freely around the keyboard and the fingers can move very, very independently. Uh, another important element of my teaching is about coordination. Um, if the body is well coordinated, it works at its best. Um, so for instance, um, if we're sitting well, then we feel comfortable, everything's in balance, and the arm is in balance, and again, it works comfortably. We're not going to get tension or overuse on, on some muscles and underuse on others. And the other thing is that um, when we're playing, traditionally, again, sometimes a lot of us were, were taught really that technique was about finger work. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, we use the whole body to play the piano. And for instance, if we're playing forte, then we really need to use the power from the shoulder, from the upper arm. And so we're learning how to coordinate the arm and the body so that we're using the right muscles for the task in hand. Um, and so we're learning, so we're using the larger muscles to support the smaller muscles as they play. So I start with actually starting from a very broad movement when I'm teaching. So I'll show a movement in a very free way. So if we're talking about leaps, for instance, we might just do very free leaps in the air, you know, so that we're not worried about accuracy. We're not thinking, which note do I have to go to? The muscles aren't tensing up. We're giving a very free movement. And then we come to the piano and try it at the piano, not worrying initially if we play some wrong notes, just getting the feel of the freedom of movement of the whole arm. And then eventually we'd start to put it into practice in, in an actual piece and we work towards greater accuracy. But what you will find is that the accuracy is much likely to arise if your arms are working freely. If you're tense, you're actually more likely to play wrong notes. So the more we work with achieving freedom of movement, the more accurate our playing will be. Um, another important aspect of my work is in injury prevention and also recovery. Um, having had an injury myself, I'm very much aware of this and I work a lot with injured pianists. So everything I've been working on is to do with making sure that we keep safe, that our hands keep healthy at the piano. And what I've learned over the years is that healthy playing is also good and musical playing. Um, what I discovered as I was working through um, aspects of, of piano playing for my own playing um, is that as soon as I felt, oh, that feels more comfortable, that feels more at ease, what I also noticed was that the sound improved and perhaps a passage of music improved. And so everything that I was working at technically or physically was having a really beneficial effect on the music and on the sound. So. What I've learned from that is, is good, healthy technique is also really good musical technique as well. The two go hand in hand. Um, and the other thing I, I try to do is to make it fun, make it interesting. Um, I think so many people um, teach technique or they, we've learned technique in, according to very, very boring, tedious exercises. And uh, particularly when I'm working with younger pianists, I feel you have to make it fun. Um, to give them the motivation to, to do that aspect of the work. Um, so I'll move on to the next question here, which was from JL, who said, what is the difference between the various resources you offer and which would be most useful for, and he said, for me as a, as a pianist, for my son and, and also a student and for him in his teaching? Um, so I'm just going to introduce three of um, my resources here and just explain the difference between them. Um, uh, for you, JL, I would certainly recommend um, The Complete Pianist, which is this huge encyclopedic book. 
Um, it's very large. I'll um, kind of feel a little bit overwhelming at first, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that is really very much aimed at an adult reader um, for pianists who are really from about grade five right up through to um, music college or even professionals. Um, for your son, um, I've just been creating some new books which are for children. Uh, they're being published in April, so this isn't the um, published version, this is just a photocopy. Um, but there are three books um, in a series that are coming out. Um, so if you can wait just a few weeks, um, it's called the Essential Piano Technique Series, and um, they would be ideal for your son, who I know is a beginner, and these are um, working for beginners in their first two or three years of piano playing. Um, and then for you as the teacher, um, you may be interested in a teaching course, which is online, which I created with Informus Publishing, with Ryan, who's organizing this event. And that is a nine hours um, series of videos, uh, which is about um, how we teach um, students of all levels and of all ages too. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so I hope that's useful, JL. Um, Donald asked then a question, which is about the complete pianist. And he said, what level is it for? So as I said, it's about um, grade five upwards. And how should I approach it? Um, and uh, many people ask me this question. Um, because it's so huge, they don't know where to start. And I think there's two main ways you can um, you can uh, approach it. I do know many people who've started at page one and read all the way through to the end. Um, and I think it's been structured in a way that it um, means that you can really understand things as you go through, um, because to a certain extent, you won't understand what I'm talking about in the musicianship stages, later pages, if you haven't read the, the technical um, uh, descriptions at the beginning. Um, the only danger about reading it all the way through in that way is that you know, there's probably a tendency to skim through and read it rather quickly. Um, but there is a lot of information in there and I would strongly recommend that if you are reading it through chapter by chapter to really take your time over it. There's material in this book which I would have taught a music college student over four or five years. Um, so it's worth taking each chapter um, reading it, watching the videos, um, trying out the exercises at the piano, um, to, to really absorb the techniques before you move on to the next section. Because I find with anybody, it takes a long time to absorb a new technique because we're cha maybe changing a habit of a lifetime. Um, so you often have to, you know, read it, watch the video, really try it out quite a lot of times and then put it into practice also in some pieces before it's really fully embedded and become your new habit. Um, so I wouldn't rush through it. Um, it's, it's useful to have on the shelves, obviously. And some people uh, treat it more like, you know, an encyclopedia that you might have on your shelves and that um, you just pull it out when you have a particular problem and look up um, and see if there's a solution for your problem. Um, and I mean, in some ways, maybe the ideal way would be to read it all the way through and then to come back and revise the specific sections that you feel might be useful. Um, if you are dipping in and out, you will find that, for instance, there's a technique which I use a lot and talk about a lot, which I call the parachute touch. And so if you get to a section and you're reading a section on cantabile chords, it will talk about the parachute touch um, and it will refer back to the, the introductory sections at the beginning. So you might have to jump around a little bit so you really understand the background of something if you're jumping in and out. But, but a lot of people have, have used it very successfully in that way. Um, oh, uh, the next question is uh, from Margaret and she said, have you considered breaking the, the book up into two or three different sections because it's way too heavy to carry? Um, we have considered it, Margaret. I'm afraid the answer is no. Um, there are no plans to do that at the moment. Um, there is one person who I know is here in the audience today who has actually um, broken it up. She's literally pulled the book apart, 
had, had it rebound into three different sections and finds that much easier to carry around. So if you want to do that, it's entirely up to you. Um, but what might be useful for you to know is that we now have a digital version of the complete clear list, which is available. And of course it weighs nothing. Um, and um, so uh, Ryan can give you details about that if that's of any interest to you. Um, it's quite easy to find your way around the ebook um, because you're on your laptop, you can search for particular topics and, and search for particular words and, and access the, e the um, videos very easily. Um, so that might be something to consider. Nothing I can do about the weight of it, I'm afraid. I didn't realize until I'd finished writing it just how enormous it was going to be. Um, so the next question was, um, is the online course, Teaching Healthy Expressive Piano Playing, um, only suitable for teachers? And how does the material in it differ from the material in the complete pianist? Um, and I know quite a lot of people contact me and say, I, I don't know which one is most suitable for me, which one should I buy? Um, uh, so how do they differ? Um, the complete pianist covers nearly all aspects of piano playing. Um, so there's a lot about technique, there's a lot about musicianship, there's a lot about the practicality as such as, you know, how do we sight read, how do we practice, uh, motivation, learning a piece, um, how do we keep healthy. Um, so it's, it's very encyclopedic, it really tries to cover everything. Um, and it's a, really rather more about how to play the piano rather than how to teach it, although of course there is a lot about teaching as well. Um, so that's why we created this uh, video course, um, because that um, focuses primarily on how to teach the technique. And so it's focusing more on the technique, obviously because I see them both as interconnected. There's a lot of discussion about musicianship as well. Um, but um, so it covers more about technique, less about the musicianship. Um, but it also talks a lot about how to teach the technique at all different levels. So there's many more examples of teaching at beginner and inter intermediate level, um, sort of musical examples. So if you are a teacher, I think you would find that very, very um, helpful. Uh, in fact, I do know some people who, who've used both and found that a helpful doubling up of, of, of information, really. Um, I mean, there is some overlap, obviously, um, particularly about some of the, the core um, foundational techniques. Um, but I think in some ways, the other thing is that some people uh, prefer to learn from video. Some people prefer to, to read a book. Um, so again, it depends on your preferred learning style. Um, so next question, JL again. Um, how does the art of piano fingering overlap with the complete pianist? Um, yeah, I can see that with several books available now, it can be a bit confusing as to what, what covers what. Um, now, the art of piano fingering, which is this book, um, which is again available in print and also in um, digital. This was written all about 25 years ago. Um, and the, the history of that was I was teaching a lot of students and we would keep coming up against scales and arpeggios and they never sounded as even as the student wanted them to be. And um, I started looking at their fingerings and realizing that their fingerings weren't good, but they were all the fingerings that they had learned from an early age, um, maybe from the associated board or, or from whatever fingering book they were using. And many of them just didn't um, work well at the piano. So, so I, I went through a, a very laborious task in a way of going through every single scale and arpeggio and working out what I considered to be uh, the best fingerings for those scales and arpeggios according to the principles of how the hand fits best onto the keyboard. So how to make the best sounding scales to keep them smoothly flowing. Um, and so that was how this book developed um, it's very detailed, it gives you 
uh, fingering charts for all the scales and arpeggios and, and explains the principles behind all these new fingerings. Um, I do cover some of that in The Complete Pianist. There are a couple of chapters on fingering, um, but obviously it doesn't cover it and it doesn't include every single fingering. Um, so if you want to go in more detail, um, that, that is the, the, the book that would be helpful for that. Um, now, uh, quite a lot of people have been asking about the new beginner's books. Um, and um, these are coming out in the UK. Uh, the launch date is April the 24th. Uh, I know a lot of you have been waiting for a long time for these to come out. Uh, but it's been a lot of work and um, yes, it, it's taken quite some time to really complete them. Um, in the US, they won't come out. There's going to be a, a, a slightly different US version, um, which is coming out on May the 17th. So US spelling and some of the terminology has been changed and so on. Um, and it's, it's published by uh, Peter's edition. Initially, they're going to be only in print. Um, but yes, we are planning a digital version, but it won't be immediately. Um, and I don't have a date for that yet. Um, but actually, one way to find out about that would be to sign up on our mailing list, um, which is on boscoacademy.com. Um, and that, uh, and if you sign up then, then we can uh, tell you when that becomes available. Um, so these books... Um, what I was wanting to do by creating these books was to um, show how we, uh, teachers, a, a lot of, of my students are teachers, people I work with, and they've often said to me, I, you know, they love the um, exercises in The Complete Pianist, but they wanted more exercises that they could use for teaching their, their beginners and their children. So, so we filled a gap here. Um, so these books are going to be a series hopefully about six of them eventually, there are now three, um, which are going to, uh, the first three take you for the first two or three years, and then the, the next three will take you up to about grade five level, to up to a level where, where people might be moving on and reading the complete pianist, but perhaps for the more advanced um, repertoire. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to make these fun, um, it, it's been a fun time for me, quite different from writing the, the rather serious uh, Complete Pianist. Um, we've got lovely illustrations. Um, we've got wonderful new pieces of music written by Aaron Burrows and, um, and charming words written by Carl Heap, um, which are all very, very child friendly. And we're using the same principles of um, technique, um, but in a child friendly way. Um, so, for instance, um, all the terminology is child-friendly. Uh, we start with broad movements. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, you know, if, we, if we're doing leaps, or what we just call those rainbows, I talk about actually dropping the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So they drop something down and drop and drop and drop, and then just start with the... So actually, that's one of the very first exercises. So you see what we're doing there? We're using the whole keyboard. Uh, we're using freedom of movement. We're starting with a, a big movement. And so it gets the students away from starting just around the middle C, which can feel uh, very restricted. Um, and so with each new technique that we introduce, we're starting with a very broad movement, usually away from the piano. So when I'm talking about moving from forward and forward and back movements, we start with actually some clapping games um, so that we're just releasing any tension in the elbow that they're moving forward and back. And then they start to get the feeling that they can play here and they can play there they're on the black notes and on the white notes. And so they're using that freedom um, just to move around the keyboard in all the different directions. Um, now, um, Uh, by the way, these are pretty much aimed at children from the age of about five up to about nine. Um, uh, Ryan and I are intending to create an adult beginners course, which can also be used for adult returners. 
Again, we don't have a date for that. We're working towards it. So again, if you're interested in that, do sign up to the mailing list and uh, we'll let you know when, when, that's, when that's available. Um, now, Anna came up with a, a question which I know is going to come up um, very much over the next year or so. She said, how can I combine the Essential Piano Technique series of books with other method books? So she's currently uh, in France, I believe, and she's using the Méthode Rose, um, which Anna, I'm not actually familiar with. Um, and what I was um, very much aware of, um, uh, and actually what, her second question was, and what do my books not cover? So what does she need to supplement them with? Now, what we've said in, in these new technique books is that um, they can be used alongside most modern uh, method or tutor books. Um, and I have tried to make that possible as much as I possibly could without compromising my own views on, on the order in which we should teach different aspects of technique and, and how we should te teach technique. Now, um, for instance, most of the, I think the, the Metal Rose is quite an old um, method book, which probably starts around the Middle Sea area. And um, this is something that I've been arguing against for many, many years, um, because the problem with starting beginners playing only around the Middle Sea area is that they start, have to start in this position. And you can see what happens is, as I go to this position, what happens is, my shoulders come in, they might even come up a little bit, my elbows come in, my, and my hand twists a little bit. It's not a good, healthy approach to the piano. Um, and with many method books, students start with that approach um, and they, they stay in it, maybe in that position for, for many months before they really start to move around the keyboard. And I really wanted to get away from that. So I am follow the principles which are which many modern method books do also follow, was that we should start teaching um, some initial pieces by rote, by imitation, so that we can use the full range of the keyboard. So, if it, so they can leap around from octave to octave, they can move on to the black notes, they can use much more of a full range of the keyboard. Um, so I have actually started with using a lot, playing on the black notes. Um, because the most comfortable position for the hand to be in is what we call the Chopin position, where the second and third and fourth fingers are playing black notes and the thumb and fifth finger are playing white notes. So I'm trying to, at the beginning, create a really beautiful hand shape, which is very natural, which is very difficult to achieve if you're doing everything around the middle C area, where the fingers have to be a little bit more curved and as I said, everything's a little bit in an uncomfortable position. Um, so, um, so that's one thing that's a little bit different. Uh, two other things that are a little bit different, I introduce playing hands together a little bit later on, um, because I think it's much more, I think that can be very challenging, um, especially if we're also trying to read um, two staves of music. And what tends to happen is we become mentally tense from reading complex music and the mental tension goes into physical tension, um, which means that then they're trying to play hands together and their, their arms are tensing up. So I've introduced each technique as it, as it comes up um, in uh, hands separately, but with each hand being exercised equally. So the left is exercised as much as the right is. Um, which means it's slightly confusing at first because it's a different approach to how it's written on the page, but you will soon get used to it once you've done it and looked through it and, and tried it a few times. Um, and um, uh, so, and yes, I introduce chords a little bit later on as well than most people introduce them because actually chords are quite challenging, especially for young hands. Sometimes they, they try to play chords and their hand collapses. So it's much more important to establish a really strong hand shape before we play too many chords. So I put those a little bit later. So 
Um, you may find that the progression is slightly different from your method book, but the principles can be, a, 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 can be introduced at any point. So there are several different ways you could use these. You could start with your method book, and whenever there's something which comes up where it's not been talked about technically, you could start to introduce a section from my books and, and jump between the two. You could start by using my books, but the one thing I'm not really covering is, is in detail note learning, uh, FACE and so on, or, or learning rhythms. I do a lot of clapping exercises and simple rhythmic exercises, but it's not really a theory tutor book. It is, um, they're more technique and musicianship books. Um, they do have pieces in, so there's quite a bit of repertoire. Um, so you may find, so you, you do need to supplement it either with your own activities or with something from a, a more traditional method book, if that's what you're using. Um, and I think the other thing is we all know that students progress at very different speeds. So with some students, uh, for instance, they'll, you know, a very, very talented student will whiz through this really, really quickly um, and maybe even skip a few sections if they're finding it really easy. Whereas another student who might be struggling more may need to use all everything that's in this book and have some extra supplementary material added in from another book as well. So I've tried to... Um, write them in a way that will help you to use them in conjunction with another uh, method book. Um, but it will take a little bit of time for some of you to, to work out just how to do that. Um, I think an experienced teacher will quickly find out how the best way to do that. I mean, I know a lot of people, for instance, have used Dozen a Day alongside a teacher book. So it's not so very different from, from that approach. Um, now the last questions I had were, um, what is the Roskill Academy and how can I join? Um, and how can I train in the Roskill method? Um, I'm, I'm uh, very excited that uh, just today we've launched the new Roskill Academy website. Uh, which is rosskollacademy.com. And here we've brought together a lot of information which I think will be useful for teachers, for pianists at all different levels. Um, so it brings a lot of information together. It's got quite a lot of free information. It's got videos. It's got a whole section on um, preventing injury and recovering from injury and talks about um, all the different uh, conditions that a pianist might face. That's all been brought over into the um, into this website from uh, another website that I used to have it on. Um, it's got information about these books and the different resources, and and you can just quickly click on it and, and purchase it very quickly from that website. It's also got a recommended teachers list um, uh, of um, it's fairly small list at the moment of people who I feel confident are. are well experienced in, in teaching this sort of approach. They've either had uh, long-term regular lessons with me and they've been working through the Complete Pianist. Um, and, and some of them have also seen um, prior examples of, of the, um, and they've been working with me on the, on the um, beginner's books. Um, it also um, gives uh, some information about how you can train to be, uh, a, a teacher following this method. I mean, obviously the uh, video course um, is very useful in that. What we're trying to do that is extend that um, in the autumn into what we call a blended course where um, people will actually be doing, uh, watching the videos on their own at home, but at the same time, synchronously with other teachers. And then I would come in and we'd have some one-to-one, -one uh, some face-to-face online uh, sessions in between where you can catch up, you can talk about any problems you've had, how you've been putting it into practice with your students, any problems that have come up. So I can sort of give a little bit of guidance in between as you're watching the course. Um, there's also information on the website about how you can be accredited, uh, become a, an accredited teacher in this approach. Um, and we've also got, a, a, and there's information about how you can sign up to the Facebook group 
that again gives support to, to teachers who are, who are using this method. Um, it's still quite early days. Um, we're still developing the Royal School Academy. Uh, we're really um, welcoming new members. We'd love you to be a part of it. Um, and as I said, please do sign up to the mailing list and we can send you more information. Um, so those are the questions that I had in advance. Have we got um, further questions, Ryan, that um, people here today have been asking? Yes, we do. Right. <laughs> um, so the first question I have, I'm not sure exactly who this is from, but it's a question around arpeggios. And is it, do you use the same movement preparation or exercises for all pieces? Or is the technique to play arpeggios freely at speed different between pieces like, for example, the last movement of the Moonlight Sonata or the Chopin um, Opus 10, number one etude? Right. Um, there's different use of the words arpeggios there, in a way. I mean, the last movement of the Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata I call Broken Chords. Um, and yes, that is a slightly different technique because we've got to bring the thumb into position. Um, I think of arpeggios as the ones that are continuously moving up the keys. Um, and again, the, the Chopin Opus, Opus 10, 10 number, number one. one. Oh, yes, yes. Opus 10 number one. one. Yeah. Yes, so that sort of combination of broken chords and arpeggios in a way is, is again, isn't it? Um, yes, they all have a slightly different approach to um, technique. Um, each of those pieces that you've mentioned are discussed, actually, in The Complete Pianist. Um, I think the important thing is to is to have freedom of movement again and not to um, stretch out too much. So, for instance, in that first um, Chopin etude, um, there are two, there's arguments about ways to teach this, and I have had many, many students come to me who've been told that they should stretch out their hand and be ready to play all the first four notes. So, like, so that what they're doing is really trying to reach out to that tenth to be ready. Now, that is very, very tiring, and I've had several pianists come to me who've actually hurt themselves from trying to play that piece in that way. Um, for pianists who don't have huge hands. So if you have small or medium-sized hands, what you have to learn to do there is um, to, how to avoid the stretch not how to stretch out as far as you can, because there's a limit to what our hand can take. So what you're wanting to do there is avoid the stretch. And the way to do that is to think about note by note. So going from thumb C to G is not a stretch. So at this point, at any one moment, my hand is not a, a stretch. Then to two to four is not a stretch. Four to five is not a stretch. And then I bring the thumb back into position. So at no point in that arpeggio type passage is my hand at the full stretch. So these are the things that are really important to consider. Um, if you're doing a flowing arpeggio that's just going straight up, um, we need to think firstly about the fingering. And again, I'd look at that in the fingering book because I use different fingerings to the normal ones. Um, we need to think about how the thumb comes under, which again is in both the children's books and in, and in the complete pianist. Um, and we need to, to keep it flowing. So we need to have a flowing arm movement so that we don't get any, we don't have any lumps and bumps. So it really flows through. Um, so without going into more detail, I can't really answer in any more detail than that for the time being. Great, okay. And then following on from that, um, there are warm-up exercises in the complete pianist, but do we also need to stretch or warm down after, or do warm-down exercises after a long practice? Oh, that's a really good point. Um, and something I keep forgetting to say to people, so thank you for, for reminding, reminding people about that. Yes, if you um, think about athletes, if you watch the Olympics, um, you know, the, the athletes are warming up before they play, and they're actually cooling down afterwards. And yes, it's, it's a really good approach. So um, what I suggest is if you're using my warm-ups, you do that before you play. And then when you first start to play, you play something which feels a little bit easy for you. So something that's not too fast, not something that's not too challenging, just to ease yourself into your playing. So you're not rushing into trying to do something really challenging. 
And then at the end, finish off by just playing something calmer, a little bit more gentle. Um, and you could do another few stretches. Um, if you found that you've got a little bit tense from the last piece you were playing, you could do some shoulder releasing exercises or do the warm ups again as a cool down. Yes, you can use it at any point. I also often suggest to people, especially if they've got tight shoulders, that you know, in a, every if and whenever they have a short break in the middle of their practice, they just do some shoulder releasing exercises or something, just to keep everything moving, so they don't allow themselves to get tensed up during their playing, because there is a danger that we, we keep the shoulder in one position and we don't move it enough. Um, and Manisha asks. Um, just, well, you may have already answered this in the, your first, the first question, but they want to know what, the dif what difference you see between your approach and the Suzuki method. Right. Um, I'm not an expert on the Suzuki method. I'm not Suzuki trained, um, but I do have many friends who teach with the Suzuki method, and I actually regularly teach on a Suzuki uh, teach training course. Um, and and the, the teacher there, um, Denny McMillan, who teaches a course in Cambridge, um, asks me to come and talk about the technical aspects with them. And Jenny and I, and I have had many discussions, and we find that my technical approach does work very, very well with the Suzuki approach. And I think at that beginning stage is how um, Suzuki also is, is um, working away, from, uh, is doing everything by rote, um, so my my uh, book should work very well alongside that. Um, I think that also the idea that, that the musicianship and the technique are very intertwined, they're depend interdependent on each other. That um, So there are many principles and, and, and the, the ethos of them, I think, are very closely aligned. Um, and, and I think keeping, keeping it as very much a sort of simple learning process um, is something that I've, I've tried to, to bring into the children's books as well. Okay, and then in your courses and books, do you have any tips for people with smaller hands, for example, somebody who can just reach an octave? Right, uh, yes, um, I teach many people with smaller hands, and it's uh, very much on my mind all the time. Um, there is a section in the Complete Pianist, which is called Pianist with Small Hands, I think. It's actually at the back of the book, um, so you have to, you have to go and find it. Um, uh, because anything, I put things at the back which didn't relate to every single pianist, so that's why they're at the back. It's not, they're not at the back because they're less important, just because, so I put things about recovering from injury and so on. I put that at the back because it's not relevant to everybody. Um, but yes, I think the, the most important things for pianists with small hands is that you're not, I mean, so what I've actually tried to do here in the beginner's books also is to be very much aware of the size and the strength of, of, the, of the children's hands. Um, but also for adults, there is a tendency for adults with small hands to think, I've got to keep stretching my hand. I've got to keep trying to get, get a bigger stretch. But there is a limit to what you can do. You know, nobody would ask a Mozartian singer to sing Wagner. They've got the wrong sort of voice. They're physically not capable of it. So to a certain extent, we need to be a little bit cautious about the repertoire we choose. Um, if you do, if you're desperate to learn a, a piece by Rachmaninoff, then rather than feeling that you've got to stretch every chord, really think carefully as to whether you can leave some notes out. But the most important technique you can learn and this, again, uh, there's quite a lot of this in the, in the Complete Pianist. It's like I was saying for that shop on first etude. You have to learn when to release the stretch. So, for instance, if you're playing a sequence of chords, you have to learn to open out for the chord, but then to relax the wrist in between. And I've actually introduced that in the children's books. We call it um, jellyfish jumps. Um, so what you're doing is you're jumping onto a chord, and you might even open out the, the, the hand a little bit to do that. But then when you come up into the air, your hand is like jelly. So you're imagining that you're a jellyfish. So in the children's books, I start with just doing this movement in the air, and then they do it on their knee. And then they start to do it just on a fifth. And of course, at the beginning, we're not doing any stretches. Uh, we're just trying to learn every technique, 
at the comfortable uh, span that's comfortable for your hand. And then only at a later stage do we start to stretch out into, into, into bigger stretches. Um, so it's really important. Um, I don't want to scare anybody, but with pianists with small hands are more at risk of becoming injured. Um, so you've got to have more regular breaks in your practice. Um, you've got to learn where to release the stretch. Um, and, uh, and, and also to be a little bit realistic about, about which pieces you choose. Okay, your next question is, are there any specific issues or teaching principles that we should keep in mind for hypermobile hands or people with hypermobility? Ah, right. Well, again, there is a short section on this um, in, uh, at, the, at the back of the Complete Pianist. And I'm, I'm also very much aware of this when I was uh, writing the children's books because um, I think there's similarities with children's hands, which are, which are weak. Um, they tend to collapse here in these joints and in these joints um, and in hypermobility as well. There are some links there. And I think it's important to um, strengthen the hand carefully. Um, um, and, and very consistently, rather than to try and um, force things to happen. Um, if you're hypermobile, you have a huge advantage in many ways, in that you can stretch further um, than somebody of your hand size who isn't hypermobile. You've got more flexible joints. Um, that can be a huge advantage, but don't overuse it. Don't find yourself playing things that are always at a stretch. Um, because that could cause some uh, problems eventually. You want, um, again, have the same ideas as somebody with small hands. Um, you know, don't always play with the fifth finger out here, stretched out. You know, try and bring your wrist around so that you're playing your finger with the support of your arm behind it. So, um, and there are... In, in all the resources, there are some strengthening exercises. I've put them in the Complete Pianist, I've put them in the, in the teacher's course, and I've even put them in the children's books. In the children's books, I've given them fun names, so the, the, the quacking duck exercise, and um, uh, knitter, natter, chitter, chatter, pitter, patter, all day long. And so it becomes a little song, and so it's, um, it's exercising this joint here, so that uh, gradually they, they are, the hand is strong enough to support the hand art as they play a chord, for instance. The other thing I, is a little bit different in my children's books is I'm not introducing forte playing, certainly not finger forte playing uh, very early because that tends to, again, encourage this hand art to collapse if they're put, trying to put too much pressure. Um, so it is important to try and strengthen the hands and there are some hand strengthening exercises in all these resources. And it's worth doing them regularly um, over a period of time. Um, and I like to do them away from the piano. So you're really able to focus on being able to strengthen the hand without tightening up the arm. That's very, very important. Because what often I find with people who are hypermobile is that their joints are weak here and here especially, and also in the thumb. Um, so they start to compensate for that by pressing on the wrist or with the elbow and tightening up the forearm. So then they can, the, the forearm can get very tense and that can lead to some problems. So what I try and do with somebody with hyper, who's hypermobile is to very, very gradually strengthen the hand arch, but do it in a way where they're not tensing up the arm. So often what we're doing is just resting the arm for instance, on um, on a on an armchair, on the arm of an armchair, or just here, and then we're just doing some exercises, even very simple things like this, um, and and actually some people find that very difficult, just moving the fifth finger from there, and just doing that regularly each day, building it up day by day, um, can really make a huge difference uh, to the strength in your hand. Great. And last question. What would you recommend for students with arthritis in the fingers other than stopping playing altogether? Ah, right. Um, I think this is a very good question and I thank you for bringing it up because 
you know, a lot of older people in particular, but it's not only older people, um, develop arthritis. And it would be a real shame to um, have to stop playing altogether because many of the people I've seen with arthritis, um, uh, uh, you know, they love their playing. And it's a really important part of, part of, part of our life, isn't it, piano playing? And so we do not want to stop. Um, actually, I'll, I'll grab this moment to mention a clinic that I run in London. Uh, it's it's uh, a wonderful organization called the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. It's BAPAM for short. And um, they support professional musicians in the UK. So it won't be relevant to all of you, but there may be something similar uh, somewhere nearby for you. Um, and they have specialist trained um, therapists in all different aspects of um, hand, looking after a musician. So um, there are osteopaths and, and um, physios and there are psychologists and there are hand surgeons and there's me. Um, and we all work together um, and, and help each other and, and uh, recommend people to each other as well if there are people with problems. Um, so if you are in the UK and if you're a professional musician, um, do get in touch with BAPAM and, and mention that you've heard me talking about this. Um, uh, so at, at BAPAM I run a clinic which is a joint clinic with myself and Mark Phillips who's a, who's a hand surgeon. Uh, we're not working on, about talking about surgery, we're talking about other ways uh, to recover from injury and we find that working together we can come to better solutions because our joint knowledge is, is huge um, and so we find we can really help people well in that way. Um, but going back to the arthritis question, uh, on the new roskellacademy.com website there is a page about osteoarthritis. don't know which kind you have but anyway have a look at that and it gives a lot of advice about um, how to, how to work around the arthritis. Obviously, I can't get rid of it, um, but I can just give some tips about how to avoid making, making the pain worse, for instance. So all the things we've just been talking about, for instance, about avoiding the stretch, that will be relevant, very relevant to you. You might want to leave some notes out. You might need to use the pedal to cover a stretch or something at a certain point. Um, so workarounds can be very important and any of the resources that I've got here will we'll talk about that. Um, one thing I find is really, really important, and this is a really fundamental aspect of my approach to technique, is that we want to minimise the impact of the hand on the keys. Um, now, if, for instance, I was to do an example here, and if I play with a very tight wrist and a tight elbow, and I really hit at the wood, this is the sound you'll hear, right? Now that actually hurt my, I hurt my fingers, I could actually feel it on my fingers, the impact, right? So that, if you jolt at the piano keys, two things are going to happen, it's going to hurt your hand a lot more. And it's going to make the sound that you're producing much more harsh. So the, the, the parachute touch that I mentioned before is a way of approaching the keys in a much kinder way. So you see what I'm doing there? I'm just coming down. I'm actually producing a sound which will... So I can produce a sound which is quite different from playing like that. You see how horrid that sound is. It's got a really sharp edge. So the more you can uh, work on really approaching the keyboard in a very smooth, gentle way, especially keeping your wrist soft, it will really uh, um, minimize the pain that you might get on the impact. Um, so, we, we can't get rid of the arthritis, but we can try to minimize the impact that piano playing will have on, on you and on the pain that you might achieve. 
So I strongly recommend that you look at the parachute touch exercises, um, that you also look a lot about how about your wrist and making sure that that keeps really soft. Um, because I know it, it that may seem odd because I'm, you may have, I don't know where you've got the, um, the arthritis, but say it's in you know, a finger joint, you may be thinking, well, I've got to be thinking about my fingers. But it's by thinking about the arm that we go back to these first principles that I was talking about earlier. If you've got a relaxed wrist and elbow and shoulder, then you're going to approach the piano in a much more relaxed way so you're not going to get that impact. It's not going to hurt your hands in the same way. Similarly, by thinking about the whole arm, say you're playing something forte. So say I'm doing Tchaikovsky, sort of. So I'm actually using all the effort from further back. I'm using the strong muscles. I'm not pressing hard in that way which really makes my hands even sort of feel, ooh, I don't want to, I don't want to play like that, it's going to hurt me. Um, so again, what we're doing is we're coordinating the arm well, we're using the stronger muscles um, to support the hands in everything they do. Um, so all of these techniques that we've been talking about are all going to be very helpful for you with the arthritis and will, I believe, also help the quality of the sound and help your, your fluency around the keyboard and your ability to create the, the beautiful sounds that you want to achieve. Is that it? Okay, well, we've come very nicely up towards uh, five o'clock. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, I hope uh, some of the things I found have been helpful and uh, we hope to see you at uh, future events. Uh, and uh, please do uh, sign up to rollschoolacademy.com uh, and uh, be in touch if you, if you need. Thank you.